Um, since we started our clinic, we've been co-counsel for parties in eight Supreme Court cases. So in those cases, we've uh, worked on the briefs and oral argument preparation, you know, on behalf of parties in the court. We've also done a whole lot of amicus briefs and cert petitions in the Supreme Court. Um, amicus briefs, if you're not familiar with them, are basically friend of the court briefs where you're representing someone who's not a party to the case but has something they want to contribute to the discussion. So files a brief to um, let the court know about that. Um, and then we filed a bunch of cert petitions, which are the way you try to get the Supreme Court to take your case by convincing them that it's worthy of their time. Um, the other half of our clinic's work is um, in the lower appellate courts. We focused so far on Seventh Circuit cases um, and have done a number of, of representations in the Seventh Circuit as well. Um, as, you'll, as you'll hear today, we're different than other clinics and that we're not focused on a particular substantive subject matter. Um, we do cases over a wide range of pro bono issues from constitutional law to criminal law to administrative law to civil law. So we, we cover a lot of ground. Um, if you're looking to really dive deep into one subject area over the course of the year and get you know, substantive expertise in that area, our clinic's probably not the best fit for you, but if you want kind of a broad exposure to appellate practice and a lot of different um, you know, types of cases, um, for someone like me with a short attention span, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, let's see, I, I often um, get the question of, you know, with our broad focus on all different kinds of cases, how we pick what we work on. Um, and the answer is that it's a little bit more of an art than a science in our clinic. We work with our students to identify opportunities and cases that are interesting, um, that are important, where we can make a difference, and um, that will ultimately be good student projects. So that can, again, range kind of significantly year to year on the subject matter. Um, our goal as a clinic is to give our students hands-on, um, um, in-the-trenches experience in appellate advocacy. Um, with few exceptions, the record is set at the time you get up on appeal. So, you know, unlike litigation clinics, we're not doing discovery and trying to figure out the facts of the case in the first instance. And, you know, that, that sort of thing, we're really stuck with the record um, that we got from the um, proceedings below. So a lot of our work is combing through that record <clears throat> to try to find and make the best appellate arguments. You know, if we're the party appealing in particular, we're spending a lot of our time trying to figure out you know, what we think the lower court did wrong and how to convince the appellate court of that. Um, a lot of our work in our clinic is research and writing briefs. Um, I, I would say the vast majority of, of our students' time is you know, strategizing what we want to do in a brief, you know, digging into the research and the record, and um, then writing and editing um, briefs. We do spend a lot of time working in teams. Um, our students work together on projects to collaborate um, on, on cases. So that's everything from sitting down to hammer, hammer out, you know, case strategy, to analyzing potential arguments, to um, commenting on drafts of the brief and editing together, and then ultimately preparing for oral argument. Um, students, unfortunately, can't argue in the U.S. Supreme Court, but they can argue in the Seventh Circuit. So we also do, um, in, in some cases, um, um, have students argue our Seventh Circuit cases, which, which is a lot of fun and a great experience. Um, this year, our students have worked on a wide range of projects. Um, we were co-counsel in one Supreme Court case this year about the Medicaid um, work requirement. That's a case that is, was up before the court this term. Um, Medicaid, as you may know, is a federal program that provides health coverage um, or, or helps with health care costs for some people with limited income and resources. Um, a couple of states a few years ago decided that they wanted to condition Medicare eligibility, or Medicaid eligibility, sorry, on um, satisfying work requirements so that eligible recipients would have to show that they've either um, been working or trying to be working or un are unable to work. Um, the Federal Secretary of Health and Human Services approved this change during the Trump administration. Um, and the question that made it up to the Supreme Court was whether that approval was in violation of the administrative 
um, Procedure Act. Um, so we're co-counsel for the respondents who say that this was in violation of the APA. Um, the case also has some mootness uh, questions lurking with the change in administration. Um, um, so the case is, is still pending, but was taken off the argument calendar for this term. So this was one where our students could dig into a Supreme Court case that raised a lot of challenging questions of both administrative law and kind of some of the, the mootness and um, uh, doctrines like that. Um, we've done two cert petitions this year um, asking the court to take cases. One was on the meeting, meaning of a provision of the federal criminal code. So we got some statutory interpretation. Um, one was that we're working on now is on the reach of a Supreme Court decision on a civil procedure issue. So it kind of harkens back to elements and what we make of precedent and the breadth of precedent and the reach of precedent. Um, and we currently have two pending Seventh Circuit cases. Um, both are direct appeals in criminal cases and the primary um, issue in both um, is a Fourth Amendment one. One is challenging the constitutionality of a search of a home and the other is challenging the constitutionality of a stop of a vehicle. So in those, our students have gotten to dig into um, constitutional and criminal law issues. Um, you know, across the board, our goal is to give the students um, the real appellate experience. So they're the ones sitting down at the table, you know, figuring out what our arguments are, figuring out which ones we should make, which ones we should um, leave on the cutting room floor, and then researching and editing and editing and editing and editing um, our our briefs in all these cases. Um, I, my my last um, note was to talk a little bit about what I think students get from. Um, our clinic, um, you know, like our other clinics, this is a great opportunity to take what you've learned in your doctrinal classes and apply it, you know, in real cases for real clients. So, you know, students get to learn from those um, um, representations, but also get to learn how to be advocates and, and lawyers. Um, so taking, taking the doctrinal experience um, a step further. Um, I, I find our Supreme Court cases to be, you know, particularly challenging. Um, there, there's usually not an easy answer in the cases. You know, the, the court's often taken a question because it's a particularly tough one. Um, um, and often the lower courts have disagreed on how to answer it. So, you know, we have a lot of fun in our clinic thinking about the really tough questions and trying to figure out, you know, when there's not a clear roadmap of how to argue a case, you know, what really are our best arguments? Um, what's going to get us five votes on the court? Um, and, and, you know, how to, how to present the case. Um, I've also liked watching our students get to work on teams and, and collaborate in the clinic. You know, the students work closely with their peers in the clinic and work closely with faculty members. So I think as in all of our clinics, that one-on-one -on -one, you know, interaction is, is both fun and a great learning opportunity for students. Um, you know, some of our students intend to be appellate advocates and we like to think that we're giving them you know, a strong foundation and good um, um, background in you know, how to appellate lawyer, but many of our students want to be litigators or some even want to be transactional lawyers. So we, we do work to give our students, you know, skills of general applicability. So we're, you know, talking about how to analyze tough legal questions, how to argue for a client, how to be more persuasive in writing, you know, how to be very thoughtful and strategic and, and pragmatic and all of that um, as well. So um, I am I know we have limited time today and I've tried to kind of cover a lot of stuff quickly. If anybody has questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, my contact information should be on um, the website, but I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions or talk further um, about our clinic. And I encourage everyone to um, please join us in one of the clinics um, in fall, yeah, if you're able. Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia Flores. I'm the director of the Global Human Rights Clinic. Um, and here in another window is Mariana Olesola, uh, who is a lecturer and fellow in the clinic. So we teach the clinic together. Um, I'm going to speak for two minutes only, and then I'm going to cede the rest of my time to Nicole and Jake, two of our really amazing students who can give you a much more effective uh, description of what it's like to be in the clinic. Um, so the Global Human Rights Clinic, as its name indicates, uh, is uh, focused on advancing uh, human rights around the world 
Um, what this basically means is that we spend uh, some of our time um, working to implement and enforce uh, international human rights treaty obligations that most of the states in the world have taken on. Um, what it also means is that we do a lot of constitutional work as well, because most human rights uh, are actually found in a country's constitutions. Um, so we work very much on implementation uh, and uh, somewhere in the nexus of international human rights and constitutional rights. Um, We've done, it's a generalist clinic uh, like the Supreme Court clinic. Um, so it's not topic specific. We've done work from, uh, we've done quite a work now, a bit of work now on police use of force, for example, in the United States and globally. Um, as Nicole is gonna talk about, we've been doing some work on the constitutional reform process in Chile. Uh, we've worked in the past uh, all over Asia, Africa, a lot in Latin America this year. Um, this year has been sort of a strange year. Usually we have in-country components to a lot of our work, whether it's fact finding uh, or students have done presentations in Geneva before the Human Rights Council or trainings uh, in Burma to workers rights groups. Uh, the pedagogical approach of the clinic uh, is really uh, understanding that lawyering is actually a lot of different jobs um, and that you will do different kinds of work over the course of your career. So it really is advocacy in its broadest sense. Uh, and that means there are students whose projects necessitate that they spend a lot of their year on research and writing. Uh, uh, and, you know, sort of we go through multiple drafts and edits and your writing will definitely improve very dramatically. Uh, and then there are other students that spend a lot of their year uh, doing presentations and trainings. Uh, we do litigation in regional fora. Uh, we have a case right now before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on behalf of all domestic workers in the United States. Uh, and so that will have a hearing and there will be uh, oral advocacy there. Uh, we've also done amicus briefs uh, at the domestic level in U.S. courts and in other courts. So. Some of the projects are much more what we would call technically legal, uh, and then some of the projects are in that sort of space between law and policy. So I think for students that are thinking about pursuing a public interest career in any way, or students that are interested in uh, learning how to operate, uh, how to practice law in a global environment and in a comparative environment, you learn quite a bit in the human rights clinic. Um, the projects are almost all collaborative with a few exceptions. There have been projects in the past, smaller projects where students have worked on their own. Usually that's just continuing students that decide to take the clinic for a second year. But for the most part, you really learn to work in teams. Um, legal practice ends up being uh, a lot of teamwork anyway, so it's a good skill to learn. Uh, and uh, the students generally sign up for the full year. So that allows us to take on really high level projects uh, and it allows you to really become an expert in your field. Uh, and every year at the beginning of the year, I tell students, you know, they think they won't become an expert in their field. You will hear from Jake and Nicole and you will realize that they do very much so. Yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Jake McGee. I'm a third year law student getting ready to graduate in three weeks. And uh, this is actually my second clinic. I was in another clinic last year and then joined the Global Human Rights Clinic this year. I know sometimes, especially as a 1L and as a 2L as well, you sometimes get caught up in so much American domestic law, you know, the important things like the rule against perpetuities and property law, that you forget that there is a whole wide world out there with um, significant problems and human rights abuses happening every day. Um, and so the Global Human Rights Clinic gives you a chance to apply international law to a real world problem. And the problem that I was working on with two of my teammates um, was related to the country of Vietnam. So if you don't know, Vietnam is one of the biggest abusers of human rights related to freedom of expression in particular. There are strict laws against criticizing the government, criticizing Communist Party leaders in Vietnam, um, what you post on Facebook, what you post on social media. And sadly, some of these big tech companies are complicit in Vietnam's abuses against their own people. You can be put in jail for up to 15 years sometimes for a post that undermines national security or is propaganda against the state. So it's a real problem affecting real people, just everyday Vietnamese citizens. And so our project, uh, the first quarter really threshed out all the international law and all the, the treaties that Vietnam had uh, agreed to and showed how they were violating that. And then our second quarter was interviewing human rights activists and stakeholders in Vietnam via Zoom and other secure platforms to see how the government had persecuted um, their human rights and also suppressed particularly their freedom of expression. So we interviewed um, over a dozen human rights stakeholders in Vietnam and got their perspective on how they have um, suffered under this regime of that's, um, yeah, suppressing freedom of expression in Vietnam. Um, so then after that, the, the kind of the pinnacle of our, of our project is submitting a report 
to the United Nations Human Rights Council. There's a process called the Universal Periodic Review where countries kind of give a report card and have a chance to respond to um, human rights uh, problems that other people see in their country. And so we are submitting an official report to the United Nations. It's an amazing thing. And we're advocating on behalf of those people that we interviewed. Um, we're partnering with another organization domestically here in the States that advocates for freedom of expression in Vietnam. And it's been a real privilege. Um, we've worked on it all year. We're coming to the kind of the end point here. We're getting ready to submit our report. Um, it's really exciting. Um, and yeah, you make a real difference in an international issue that you can sometimes you know, see in the news. You see some of these governments in Asia who are suppressing their people like in Myanmar. And we work on those issues and talk about those issues. And it's a real pleasure. Um, so like I said, I'm a 3L. This has been one of the best, if not the best experiences in my law school. Mariana and Claudia are amazing, and so are the other students as well, but the professors are awesome, um, and they really care about this work, and I would highly recommend it to anybody. Um, so our group has been working on constitutional reform. So in October of 2020, Chile voted to rewrite their constitution or to have a referendum. And so we, our client is UN Women. So we have been working on comparative research about women's rights and things and elements and subgroups that they should focus on when they're thinking about their new constitution. We've been able to provide trainings to the potential to the future constitute assembly. And we've been able to be along through this process. So this has really enabled an opportunity um, to learn from Professor Flores, who has been through a constitutional reform process prior, and also other classmates. Um, we also have an LLM in our class who is from Chile. So it's been a really immersive experience and being able to work on um, something that I probably wouldn't have otherwise, getting to see how when you rewrite a constitution in another country, what that looks like. So you really get exposed to a vast amount of subjects. I encourage students to contact me or to contact Mariana uh, with any questions. And we can talk to you about all the projects that the clinic has done in the past. We're always trying to get students with multiple language abilities. So if any of you out there have even the most basic capacity in any language and you're interested in taking the clinic, let us know because that actually influences the projects that we take next year. Uh, and then the final thing to say is how we decide projects. Um, I really look for projects that I think a clinic can really make a contribution on. So some human rights issue where we can make an intervention that's going to matter um, and something that, you know, is obviously important. There's there's a million things going on in the world right now. Um, there's some there are some areas in which we can really have an impact. And so that ends up being uh, somewhat decisive for the projects we take. First, I think I've got to we got to acknowledge um, what's been all too painfully obvious to you this year. Um, it's been a difficult year, difficult year to do your first year of law school um, in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that continues to cause um, untold pain to so many of us and the people we love. So um, I'm grateful we're finally seeing some light at the end of this tunnel. Um, and you also began law school in the wake of the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and this spring in Chicago, the police killings of Adam Toledo and Anthony Alvarez, two Mexican-American young folk, one just a 13-year-old boy, both shot by police as they were running away. Anthony Alvarez repeatedly shot in the back and Adam Toledo um, as he raised his empty hands in, in surrender. I, I personally remain um, shaken by each of these senseless killings. And sometimes I found it even difficult to function. Um, while you began law school at a difficult time and without a doubt face unprecedented challenges, what you do matters more now than ever. You can make a difference. Um, what you do both here and beyond will shape how we rise to these challenges, how we question, reform, and even transform our institutions and law. So I just want to begin by saying congratulations on almost um, making it through your first year. Um, an afternoon, y'all, where are my manners? Afternoon, um, not being in the same room, I can't do any call and response, but um, I didn't introduce myself. As Randy said, I'm Craig Butterman. Um, I direct a civil rights and police accountability project here. And what we do is we represent people who've been abused by the police um, and people who have no other access to legal counsel. We do litigation, policy, and community-based work. We strive to be a grassroots, ground-up, community-based law school clinic 
meaning that our, our work by design is fluid, ever-changing, responsive to community need, direction, and strategy. But our mission has been consistent from inception, and that's to improve police accountability and service in Chicago, to challenge racism in policing, and our criminal justice system while teaching students all that it means to be practicing the real world. Um, while indeed a difficult time for all of us, one of the special things about our clinic, particularly at this moment, is that we have the opportunity to support what may be the largest movement for racial and social justice in the history of the United States. Um, a few years ago, I got a confidential call from someone within law enforcement in Chicago who told me about a video of a police shooting that was being covered up. You see a white officer, a police officer, fired 16 shots into the body of a 17-year-old boy, Laquan McDonald. He fired almost all of those 16 shots while the boy lay helpless in the street. Our work in the clinic not only helped to expose the sadistic murder of a 17-year-old boy, but also the routine way that the police department covered up the murder, not as an aberration, but as standard operating procedure. And creative organizing activism by Black youth created the conditions that forced the Justice Department then to launch a systemic civil rights investigation into the police force. And our advocacy together led to a federal consent decree that seeks to remedy the police department's many years long pattern and practice of civil rights violations violations particularly targeted against Black people in Chicago. Perhaps the most historic aspect of this decree was that we won the power with our community-based clients that include clients like BLM, Black Lives Matter Chicago, the NAACP, Latinx neighborhood associations, women advocacy orgs. Um, but we won the power to monitor and directly enforce this decree in federal court. And that's the first time in my knowledge that the community has ever won the direct right to enforce a government decree against a police department in, in a federal court. And so that consent decree remains the centerpiece of a lot of our present work. And to give you a sense of our life at the moment, here's what's occupied my students over the last couple of weeks or so. Um, we brought a consent decree enforcement action to try to stop the police department's practice of raiding um, the homes of black and brown families and pointing guns at little kids, same kind of practices that led to the killing of Breonna Taylor in Louisville. You may have heard something this morning about the police department's deficient response on NPR that we talked about that attempts to leave the people most impacted on the sidelines without power to develop the policies that most impact their families. Our clinic students, um, um, drafted something that's appropriately named the Anjanette Young Ordinance, a Black social worker in Chicago with the extraordinary courage to share her video, or not her video, police video of the department's inhumane treatment of her. And the video shows 12 armed male men, police officers, bursting into her home while she was naked, changing for bed, pointing their assault rifles at her, locking her in handcuffs, still unclothed, and holding her naked for 45 minutes as she pled with them that they were in the wrong home. She's working together with us to try to stop this from happening to anyone else. Last summer, we convened a two-day evidentiary hearing in federal court organized by our students with where we put live testimony about Chicago police violence um, at the summer protest against people who were engaged in, in the protest. And yesterday, we had a two-hour follow-up session with the federal judge overseeing this consent decree to develop concrete remedies for this, to prohibit any police violence or force against people engaged in peaceful protests. Um, a team of three students litigating a mandamus action in state court. We have stuff in federal court, state court. Um, and here we're trying to put an end to CBD's decades long practice of holding people incommunicado in the bowels of police stations where people have been abused and tortured. And we meet Thursday with the brand new um, Cook County public defender to plot some of our next steps together. Because one of the things that's actually interesting in that case is that, and different, is that in addition to representing our community-based clients who are being locked up and held in community, we also represent the public defender's office, their lawyers who are being denied access to their clients. Um, I'll skip a bunch more, but we are doing more than I can even say um, in just even in the few minutes that really have allotted here. Um, and, and, and I guess what I guess what I, what I wanted to focus on, oh, let me just at least mention one other thing. 
also in the papers this morning, we're moving closer to winning community control over the Chicago Police Department because yesterday, as you may read, in, you can read in today's paper, the Aldermanic Black Caucus voted to join the Latino and Progressive Caucuses in support of a city ordinance and referendum that our students helped to write and been advocating around that could give direct community control over the police department and our advocacy there. Um, so we've been busy. I'm going to put in the chat um, um, both my contact information and um, a link to um, our website. And if you hit project history, the project history button, you can get a really vivid sense of the types of work that you'll do at the clinic. The role that students play, kind of like what, what you've already heard, students do everything from the guts to the glory. You develop case strategy, interview witnesses, counsel clients, conduct discovery, take depositions, examine witnesses in court, you research and write trial, appellate, and Supreme Court briefs, argue cases before federal judges or courts of appeals, try civil rights cases before juries. You can deliver an opening, closing statement, present to the media, lead community workshops. You're responsible for all that stuff. Um, as Claudia says, Professor Flores noted, we teach collaboration. Great learning requires the work, the ability to play well with others, and students work in teams in our cases and projects. I should mention before just closing, we have some co-requisites. Randy used to kid me about all the co-requisites that we have. Um, but so during your second year, if you choose to be involved in our clinic, you should take criminal procedure one evidence and um, to plan on before your third year of law school to enroll in our intensive trial advocacy workshop. Um, so enroll, sign up in the clinic this fall. Shoot, enroll in our clinic. Um, you can sign up as Professor Schmidt put in the, in the chat um, this August when you get that email from the registrar that lets you know the link that's live for you to register for classes. This is the place in law school you learn all it means to be a lawyer. As Sarah stressed, a real practicing lawyer, learning by doing representing real people in need of legal assistance. And guess what? It's fun to actually do the work that has the potential to positively impact another person's life, fighting alongside your clients for justice, for freedom. Um, you've earned the incredible pri privilege to prepare yourself to enter a profession that's rich with a history that includes lawyers who predated all of us who fought to make real the principle of equal justice under the law. And I just want to end by just um, shouting out to someone who's been a mentor to me and who directed the clinic when I started, Randolph Stone, um, professor here and one of my mentors who every day used to remind me that, and I want to remind you all that the service that we can give really can make a difference. It could change a person's life. It could change a policy or practice. And if we get lucky, we can change the course of human events. I'd love nothing more than the chance to do this together with you next fall. Welcome and glad to take questions at the end. As I said at the very beginning, uh, I'm Randy Schmidt. Uh, I direct the uh, clinic's employment law uh, project and we have a PowerPoint presentation that, that uh, Rachel Murphy at 2L with me um, and I put together. Um, it's pretty quick. And so I wanna go through this. So first of all, the the Employment Law Clinic is one of the oldest clinics uh, in the law school. It was in existence before I was a student. That's how old it is. Uh, it's a litigation clinic. We are focused on litigation. Different than trial work, we do a lot of litigation and then settle before trial. We represent both individuals and groups in employment discrimination cases. Uh, and currently, they're in the Northern District of Illinois or the Seventh Circuit. So in the district court, our cases consist of three groups. First, we do individual cases uh, on behalf of individuals who believe that they were fired um, uh, or other adverse action because of um, their race, sex, um, gen um, gender identity, things like that. The second, and this is kind of the biggest part of our project, is we represent a number of clients in a number of different, we probably have, uh, well, we, at one point we had probably more class actions than almost any other um, civil rights um, uh, plaintiff's employment firm uh, in the, the city. 
Um, and these involve workplace allegations of um, discrimination. And then the third, we just started doing this year, being appointed as mediation counsel, doing uh, settlement negotiations on behalf of clients. In the Seventh Circuit, we have two types of cases. We have cases where we have been recruited or we have actually found the briefs and we try to have three L's argue them. The second type of case is amicus briefs. We have a number of requests from other attorneys asking us to join uh, them in the case and file an amicus. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel to talk about the clinic experience and I'll try to control the slides. My name's Rachel, I'm a 2L, like, like he said. Um, I started in the clinic over the summer. So I've, I've been with the clinic about a year and, and had the, the chance to work on a lot of the, the different cases we have. Um, so one of my favorite things from, from over the summer was the, the chance to participate in about six different depositions. Most um, were for one, one case. So the spring quarter clinic students had done deposition outlines, um, you know, about um, the lines of inquiry we wanted to pursue and supporting documentation. So I reviewed and updated those with new information from documents and, and depositions as we went. Um, I also was able to participate in the preparation of our client for her deposition and then sat in on the, the actual depositions and uh, participated in the, the conferences before, during, and after to discuss observations, make suggestions, um, and, and whatnot. So the actual depositions, because it was during the summer, um, were done by Professor Schmidt and our co-counsel at the, the Illinois ACLU. Um, if it was taking place during the year, it would be three L's who would, who would conduct them. Um, another part of my experience I've really enjoyed is the opportunity to work on settlements at kind of all, all different stages. Um, so as Professor Schmidt said, we started with the Settlement Assistance Council program. And so I was actually able to um, research the past history of a case and evaluate whether that was a case we wanted to take on. And then when we were appointed, um, participated in the client intake interview that was uh, conducted by a 3L. Um, a different case, which is uh, the picture on the slide. I've also participated in settlement negotiations. So um, it was, uh, a mediation conducted by a federal magistrate judge that um, took place over several days, um, which let me see basically all the different strategies that uh, a magistrate judge might use to bring two parties to an agreement. Um, so one thing that came up was um, the, the other side had subpoenaed our client's phone records to try to prove that she had not made calls to this HR hotline. Um, and I had reviewed the records and done research into the phone numbers, um, which supported her, her story that she had made the, the calls um, and, and was very determined, had, had called a lot of different numbers until, until she got to the right one. Um, so at the settlement conference, that, that kind of became crucial because the opposing counsel was saying, you know, she had never made these calls and Professor Schmidt um, told the magistrate judge that wasn't the case and then called on me to, to be able to provide the specifics. So that was, that was an exciting way for me to be able to participate. And then um, this is related to the, the picture on the slide. Um, I'm currently wrapping up the distribution of a $3 million class action settlement against the pipefitters union. Um, so it wasn't a, a settlement that was evenly divided amongst the, the class members. So we had to design a formula to objectively score claims, then score the claims, and then finally call class members to gather more information as, as necessary. So one of the um, class members I called actually decided that um, he, he wanted to take back his claim. He was really concerned about retaliation. So um, I had several conversations with him and Professor Schmidt um, to 
discuss his concerns and explain um, that there is a very low risk of retaliation based on um, a lot of different procedures around confidentiality and that the clinic would be providing um, ongoing support because there was uh, a monitoring um, provision. So as I've kind of mentioned, I've had a lot of client interaction. Um, another, another part of my summer experience was uh, an oral argument related to the Seventh Circuit. So at the beginning of the summer, I edited and provided feedback on our reply brief to the Seventh Circuit, which had been done by, by clinic students. Um, Professor Schmidt ended up having to do the, the argument because it was uh, taking place during the summer because we don't, we don't get a say in that, that scheduling, but ordinarily that would be a 3L. And so I participated in the, the preparation related to that, um, providing feedback on moots, um, strategies for distinguishing cases we thought might come up. Um, and then summary judgment is also an area that I was able to do work on. So I, um, we filed a motion for summary judgment in one of our cases against the um, Chicago Public Schools Board of Education. So I provided edits and suggestion and feedback, and then they also filed for summary judgment. And so um, me and a, a, another clinic student and I wrote the response to their motion for summary judgment. Another, another case I'm on at the moment is an amicus brief to the Seventh Circuit. So I've done um, some research about what the Seventh Circuit looks for when certifying an issue to the Illinois Supreme Court um, because it's related to the Illinois Biometric um, Protection Act. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I've enjoyed about my experience is that we work with a lot of um, outside co-counsel for our cases. So as I mentioned, um, I worked on a case with the Illinois ACLU. I've also worked on, on cases with um, private uh, plaintiff side law firms, and I've really enjoyed the collaborative environment. So. Okay, thank you, Rachel. So when I always say we're a litigation, uh, project, the employment law, uh, Professor Conyers project is a trial uh, project. Uh, they try cases. Um, they represent juveniles uh, who are accused of some pretty serious crimes. They represent them if they're, if the state tries to uh, try them as adults, they, they represent them first in trying to keep them in the juvenile court system so that they're treated as children, not as adults. Um, but if they're unsuccessful, then they represent them in adult uh, courtrooms. Likewise, um, if they're successful and they can keep the, the children in the courts, in the juvenile courts, they represent them in the trial there. Um, and the, the trials are trials. Um, you know, the witnesses are called, um, they're cross-examined, students are, uh, fully active in the cases. They interview witnesses. They go and visit the crime scene. They work with um, individuals to prepare, to prepare um, uh, exhibits for the trial. And then at the trial, they will do cross-examination of uh, some of the witnesses called by the state um, against the client. Um, and like I said, they try cases. We get ready for trial and then we settle but uh, that clinic actually tries cases. Uh, Craig, did you wanna add anything? Professor Kindness can represent herself far better, but she's amazing. Um, she's an incredible, incredible teacher. Um, in addition to the, the litigation work that Professor Schmidt just described, like all of our clinics, um, they also do policy work and they do a significant amount of policy work, both with respect to criminal and juvenile justice reform. Um, something that I guess is just because it's, <clears throat> I can talk about right now, we often, we've collaborated our clinics and we look for ways sometimes for inner, just some inner clinic collaborations and we're working together right now on a case that involves a kid, um, um, young man who was, um, shot by the police, um, in a Chicago suburb 
and um, charged, not perhaps surprisingly, with attempted murder of the police. Um, and so we're working together also, and, and she also has done and worked on a significant number of cases that also involve issues near and dear to our, our um, clinic as well, issues of police abuse. And we sometimes end up collaborating both on criminal and juvenile, as well as civil rights cases that in, in where those issues are inextricably connected, like where um, people are, um, are falsely arrested or given false confessions, um, abused by police and charged and have pending juvenile or criminal cases against them. Um, she will do far more justice than I ever could to her clinic and project, but I, I find her to be one of the most inspiring teachers, um, amazing teachers, and lawyers one know in the entire nation. We have a few minutes left. Um, everyone, thank everyone for being uh, on time and sticking to the, the schedule. Um, but um, we can answer any questions you have, um, but you'll have to raise your hand I think we're all happy to answer questions about our particular clinics, but also just taking clinics in general. Um, I think that I speak for everyone when I say that, you know, we all are doing this work because we really believe in clinical legal education. And for many of us, our clinical experience was the highlight of our law school experience. Um, so I think we're happy to, to share about the clinical program more generally. Yeah. I guess one thing that I've had a hard time uh, pinning down, and I guess it's the question that everybody has about clinics, is um, is how would you recommend we think about what the time commitments are in terms of balancing, you know, our interest in participating fully in clinics with potentially taking on other responsibilities elsewhere? Well, I'll take the first stab at answering that. So the way that clinics work is you get one cred course credit. Um, for each four hours of work you do a week. So you have to put in 36 hours of work in the clinic to get one credit. In my clinic, I recommend every student sign up just for one credit um, because the work ebbs and flows. And then if they get more hours, we can either carry those forward or we can adjust their credits. I'll turn it over to the others to answer that. Oh, but let me just say, I do have students who do journals, moot court, other things, because again, they're just doing the one credit per quarter, by and large. You can take a maximum of three credits in a clinic per quarter. Um, so that's basically 12 hours of work a week. Um, I think different clinics, uh, you know, Randy's clinic, he recommends one credit. I actually recommend two to three. <laughs> so it's a different, it's a different model. Um, but, but we still have students doing, you know, a lot of different things. And I mean, maybe that's more of a commentary on the University of Chicago law student than anything else. Um, but I will say that you know, the work is really satisfying. So I think that, you know, it, it'll be about in a way where you want to spend your time. And then of course, there are times when certain things just need to be done. Um, and then, you know, it also depends on what you're doing in the clinic. So on litigation schedules, you don't have any control. So there's going to be some time where there's nothing to do. And then there's going to be time where there's a lot to do. Um, longer policy type projects, it's going to be about whether or not you are a procrastinator or you're a front loader, you know. So uh, I mean, part of what we hope that students will get out of it. And this isn't as fun to talk about, but the administrative elements of being a good lawyer are really important. And um, for example, in my clinic, we've built in, you know, there's like students have to send agendas before meetings and they send notes afterwards. And there's all of these kind of processes that are built in, which I wish very much someone had kind of created those for me at the beginning of my legal career, because they really make your life so much easier and they make you more of an effective advocate and allow you to focus on the substance. Um, so I think, you know, all of those things together end up being part of your clinic clinical experience. And it is, it's an investment of time. You know, I don't think there's a single clinic we have that's just, you know, you kind of show up and hang out and then you go and do your other things. This is meaningful work. It's important work. All of us have spent our entire lives as lawyers doing this work. Um, and so, you know, the students, they, what the work that they do matters. And so, so it's an investment of time, but I, I think uniformly it's when you're happy you've made. I, I was going to echo what, what um, Claudia and Randy said and would also suggest if you haven't already talk to some 2Ls and 3Ls who have done clinics. You know, I have found that most of my students do a journal or a moot court or, or some other, you know, significant activity in addition to the clinic in their, in their classes. So, um, you know, definitely talk to, to others on how they're balancing their schedules. A question in the chat uh, that I said we would try to answer. 
Um, so which of the clinics are um, full year clinics? Um, I'll start with mine. Uh, I don't require anything more than one quarter, but I find my students work um, usually for all six quarters if they get in uh, the fall quarter uh, as a second year student. Um, again, that would result in, in a base of you know, six credits for the six quarters, but I don't require anything beyond uh, a quarter. Uh, Sarah, you were, I think you were nodding answer, your head. My answer is the same as, as Randy's. We only um, um, require one quarter of enrollment, but in almost all cases, students stick on for the whole year. So I generally require a year uh, just because of the kinds of projects we take on. There's uh, a lot of investment work at the beginning with becoming an expert in something before you can really produce something meaningful. Um, but I do make exceptions. So I've had students come in um, especially spring quarter 3Ls uh, that really want to take the clinic for a quarter. I've made a lot of exceptions for 3Ls and put them on um, smaller projects or had them join teams. Um, but students often stay on for two years, um, but usually do a year for sure. Most students tend to remain involved in their clinic for um, significant periods of time. Um, I think the only other clinic to my knowledge, apart from the Global Human Rights Clinic that requires a year is the Federal Criminal Justice Clinic, which I believe requires a full year commitment um, in the, of the third year of, of folks of folks law school. And the environmental clinic, I think, requires two quarters, don't they? Yeah, and that's yeah. And so some clinics and, and my clinic falls in that that technically I require a minimum of two quarters, but I'm also going to be real. If something isn't working out for someone, and, and this is the rare exception, no one, I don't think any clinic is going to say, you must stay. Um, but you know, the vast majority and, and the vast major, the vast majority of students um, who've enrolled in my clinic, and this isn't unique to my clinic. Um, have chosen to stay involved over time. And then also, I mean, this is, I think, one of the cool things about the clinics here is that, um, you know, the let a thousand flowers bloom approach is that these clinics are very different from one another and do different types of, and do different types of work. And so there are opportunities to engage in a shorter term project in a particular clinic, kind of being out in a short amount, shorter amount of time. Um, my clinic, like, I think, like, Randy's and like Claudia's and, and like Sarah's tend to um, we engage in complicated pro complicated projects and um, and sometimes like when I talked about the consent decree that's probably a 12 year project that's not like a you know that's not something that's going to end um, in a single quarter um, but there are meaningful opportunities to learn about what it means to be lawyer and be a lawyer and engage in different parts of litigation and policy making. Last thing I guess I'll say on this is that that students, um, um, students at least within what well, you can in you can participate over the course of your law school life in more than one clinic. You can enroll in total. You can earn up to sixteen credits in for clinical work. The maximum for any one clinic is generally nine credits. Um, exceptional, but within the Mandel Clinic, and you can look what are the Mandel Clinics um, on, online, um, within the Mandel Clinic, it's at least possible to actually enroll, and this typically won't happen into your third year, in two clinics at the same time, but for reasons even Alex, you know, that but based on your question, it's like we, we generally would recommend one at a, one, one at a time, but um, with, consent, with instructor consent, um, you know, we've we've had, a matter of fact, I think I have right now at least two students who um, who may be enrolled also in other clinics simultaneously. And as Claudia said, they're managing it. They're managing. I've you know, and this isn't just me, but we've had students in journals, law review, um, lots and lots of Type A personalities. But I also welcome some Type B personalities to mix it up. The rules on clinic credits and things like that are in the student handbook, but. As uh, Craig pointed out, you can take up to nine credits in any one clinic. You can only take three credits of clinic a quarter is the max. Um, but if you're going to do that, you have to get permission of the clinical instructor um, because the last thing we want is you not to get enough hours to get those three credits and then not graduate. I know that's a long way off for you, but we want you to graduate. All right. Well, um, thank you all for attending. 
Um, and, you know, certainly there is information on each of the clinics on the law school's website. Our email addresses are there. Uh, you should feel free to reach out to us and ask specific questions about what we do in the clinic, the time commitment, things like that. Um, and then the other thing is, yeah, talk to 2Ls um, that you know um, who are working in the clinics and get their perspective. That's always a very good way to, to find out what's going on in the clinics. So with that, unless there are other comments from any of the other clinical faculty, uh, I think we'll call this a meeting.